Welcome to a pie with Shawnee B coming to you from the Kinsale Advertising Festival. I have a guest with me who I have tried on a couple of occasions in London to do this podcast with, and we both happen to be in Cork at the same time. So here we are welcoming a guy who is one of the advertising legends. He has his own company called Uncommon, which he's recently set up. We're going to hear all about that. And um, his name is Nils Leonard. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, sir. Are you liking Kinsale? Love it. <laughs> Love it. Try this to... was the keynote speaker. He's just literally finished 10 minutes ago, and we have, a, we have a short podcast this week, I think, because he's rushing off somewhere. Start by telling me what synopsize your speech and how Uncommon came out of you working in a big traditional agency called Grey, uh, why you left, and why you believe you need to do something different to what's being done. Okay. So... Uh, the speech was you can't find peace by avoiding life and I think it's a sentiment that I started to definitely feel at Grey but in general in our industry which is you talk about being slightly tired of it all and over it I don't blame you I guess my take on that is rather than just kind of shrugging it or whatever I fear cynicism like massively and I started to feel it creep into my job and I find it very motivating so I knew that I had to change something and I looked at it and said okay Yeah, it's broken if you look at the rules as they currently exist. Mm. It's broken if you look at the industry as it exists and ask permission to change within it. It's fucked if that's what we do. So I said to myself, well, actually, how do we do it a completely new way? What do I wish I was doing? Because the answer behind all these changes and all this theory you read in the magazines, data and create, it all comes back ultimately, I think, to what you just love doing as an individual and how you find your soul in your work. And I realized there's a couple of bits of work at Grey that had moved me more than others. Things like the Angina Monologues, which was for the British Heart Foundation, a, a show at the Haymarket. Uh, that ran on Sky One, uh, things like Life Paint for Volvo, and I suddenly became aware that it's not as hard as you think it is to make new products, to make new brands yourself. And if we spend half our lives convincing, frankly, average brands to do slightly better stuff, why wouldn't we just be our own clients? And that theory, I think... I like your theory, yeah. Yeah, but, and, and I think it just spoke to me like a bit of freedom. And I think we are very dependent on clients and very subservient. And there's a lot of talk of the loss of bravery and all that other shit. Well, if you're your own and you're talking to people about making brands and you really have done some yourself, it completely changes the dynamic. Mm -hmm. And so reached the end of Grey and said to myself, you know what, I'm not going to get cynical. I can't do that. And left with Lucy Jameson and Natalie Graham, the other partners from Grey, and started Uncommon Creative Studio. Right. So explain what what Uncommon is. I want to come back to just the difference between between that and the big... I mean, my, my background is... JWT New York, BBDO New York, Saatchi and Saatchi. So, I mean, I've worked in all yeah, the big right. 80s. And what jaded me more than anything was internal politics, internal yeah. cannot do, yeah. internal they won't buy, internal you're wasting your time, yeah. uh, suit-led culture, quashing creativity, mm. to the point where I think in the ad business over the last 10 years, that graph you showed where, Nils Neil showed a graph where in 1996 or f- three or one, Something like 70% of people when asked, do you like the ads that you see on television, said, yes, they're as good as the programs. Today, that's minus negative equity 20 and has been sliding down over the last 20 years. The idea that ad agencies, which are meant to be bastions of creativity, end up factories where the good leave and the dross stay. Yeah. 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 But how does that, I mean, that doesn't follow success. I, I agree with you. So I looked at the change in how people are responding to agencies, but also talent. So when I got to Grey, I was lucky enough, whatever you want to say about the big networks, the one thing that was true of Grey was that it was fucked and they knew it. Yeah. You know, people were saying it's where you go to die. It had become about the opposite to creativity. And ultimately when you stop clients or anybody and That's opposite of creativity, dull well, greatness. Like, well, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. well, saying yes, mechanizing work, you know, success being, oh look, we actually filled up a media plan. Yeah. That's not success. Yeah. All those things. We used to call the people that you mentioned in agencies, dementors after the Harry, you know the, <laughs> the Harry, Harry Potter, Potter thing. They yeah. suck the. Oh, that's scary. They come, yeah, yeah, but they suck. You know, yeah, they, yeah. they it's like and, um, the soul out of you. And so we made. I, I learned loads there, dude, about culture and about internal culture and about how to change that genuinely. And ma- and I think people use the word culture like it's fucking soft. Yeah. I think it's incredibly hard. It's often really divisive. And so we changed the culture to be purely about everyone's voice being heard, about creativity being the answer, and anybody who wasn't buying into that, they yeah. went. Yeah. And there's, that's the other unsaid thing, I think, about cultural change, which is this pretense that it all makes it all happy. It mm. doesn't. It often does quite the opposite. People were like, I was like, well, I want to remove offices because I think actually creatives, by the way, can be some of the worst at defending the way it was without that's knowing true. it. 
I've got my office. The door's always shut. This idea that the the cleaning lady can have an idea. No, yeah. she can't really. Yeah. No, no one, no one fucking can. Yeah. And has she got sharks on her shelf? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, well, hang on. But that that starts to piss me off because mm. what that ultimately means is we well, were as broad as the vision of those two quite stubborn fuckers in an office. Mm. And actually, what I was seeing was far better stuff coming from certainly the rise in digital, but also just other industries, music, technology, and experience. Yeah. I didn't want to make more of that stuff that Grey were making. I wanted to make something else. And so we, we changed the culture there around that and, and tried to, to make it a place where creativity... I mean, what was interesting for me was I was on the... I was the global head of Gillette, mm. okay? Um, and, what, you know, when you're on the strategy side, so when you're a strategist and you kind of spend ages coming up with an idea and you have some people in the industry saying it's probably the best thing Gillette have ever done and then Gillette don't buy it. And I, I always just kind of... My bosses would say, throw my toys out of the pram. Mm, yeah. But as a planner, I go, that's what you need to do. And yep. if you don't want to do it, yep. get another planner on your business. Yep. Gray then took Gillette off BBDO, yep. about it for like 100 years or something. And what I was interested in with Tor and what you did was that one person can still go into these big companies and yep. change it, yep. which is which did surprise me. Yep. I love that. So there's another story. Uh, I, I love, in our game, unlike most others, people are the secret. Yeah. I heard a story once, apparently, about Mr. Sorrell attempting to buy a media company called Naked when they were really hot. You remember Naked? Mm, they yeah, were fucking yeah, awesome. Yeah. There was a conversation, apparently, that happened where he said, OK, fine, if you're not going to sell to me, I'm going to buy everyone else and make it really hard for you, and you're ultimately going to ruin it. And John, who now isn't with us, bless him, uh, said something incredible. He said, well, OK, that's cool. But ultimately, you're going to be in a room. Your people are going to be in a room. Your best three people versus our best. Yeah, and that's ultimately that's how true. it's going to go down. And that's how we know we'll be okay. Yeah. And I think that the power of creativity and cultural change and leadership and just all of that other stuff is the difference. And I don't care what sort of business you set up, that it'll always be precious. That'll always be worth something. Mm. Loads of people are talking about, oh, Martin's thing. Are you worried about the fact he wants to bypass creative agency? No, he's just basically declared he has no interest in the industry of creativity. Yeah. That's absolutely fine with me. Yeah. Did he before, to be honest? No. Right? So a bit of me's going, that's not a problem. Why are we all worrying about what Martin's worrying about? Yeah. You know, mine is I mean, the, the, the industry crazy. became run by bean counters who were back of house. Yeah. And they, this, I don't know, this is kind of joking, but they were kind of, they seem they're jealous of the fact that their bean counters are not front of house, but they don't understand that front of house is what makes them all their beans. Do you know? I don't. I think it's worse than that. I do think they know. And I think they hate it. Okay. I don't think they're jealous that, that they want to do it. I think they don't get it. It's a magic and it's a annoying mystery. And they see clients' eyes light up and they yeah. go, fuck, what's happening? And they don't know how to mechanize it because it doesn't work like that. So you, you maybe not as, are not as jaundiced as me, but you ended up still feeling that you yeah. had to get out. Well, there were two times a year, to your point. So, so Gray were incredible. You know, Mr. Sorrell, actually, David Patton, a load of them. I got an immense amount of trust. And I'll never badmouth them now. I didn't. You know, yeah, they weren't yeah. in the way, dude. I got to do what we wanted, culturally, yeah. building, office, shape, everything. But two times a year, when the budgets came in, yeah. two times a year, there were decisions that would be forced upon you because the business above it decided to work a certain way. And if your values all year are openness, creativity, people first, talent, mm. and then two times a year there's a mechanic that says, it's not really about that. No. That jars. And after nine years, that was jarring quite a lot. And I think that was the, the moment I knew right. it. So the other thing I want to ask you before we talk about Uncommon is this idea that, uh, which I used to hate, and it's actually not happening as much now, um, is that a lot of people used to leave agencies to set their own thing up with a vague long-term to medium-term vision of eventually being bought out by one of the conglomerates yeah, yeah. to shut them up. And yeah. a lot of that happened. How are you f in that yeah. area of Uncommon? Right, so the fantasy with Uncommon is, uh, and by the way, I've always talked very openly and I think creatives should be all right with talking about money. Mm. I think we are awful at it and we yeah, pretend yeah. that there's some sort of compromise on our sanctity by talking about sale. I want to be fucking rich, man. Yeah. I think we are powerful people as, as what we do, and I think we should all get paid. But I think you have to ask yourself what you want to get paid for and how, right? And, and how you feel inside when you do. So the, the aim with Uncommon, the dream is this, and I don't know whether it will work, dude, but the dream is this. If we believe in setting up our own brands, as well as working with, with brilliant brand partners, you start to remove the need for an exit from your agency because the brands you've set up are your exit. Well, yeah. Right? Yeah. If you've got four or five of those. They're your pension. Yeah. Yeah. But if you've got four or five of those, as well as running a brilliant creative company, mm -hmm. making far more than advertising, by the way, then you look at it and you go, hang on, the pressure's off this agency being a cash cow. The pressure's off me riding this to yeah. a sale. And I think the last thing there is, we're not even remotely thinking about that at the moment. There's a company we have a fantasy for and we're still building it. But if it did happen, I think we would all feel, because we set this up literally on principles. I mean, they are mechanized. There is no doubt about what we're yeah. about. Yeah. 
we'd have to look at who who's going to buy us. What is that? What are they? What are they about? What are their values really? Well, uh, Sar- one of Sorrel's, and I know this, objectives was to find threats and yeah. shut them down before they got too threaty. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And th- and this idea that we will create brands yeah. as an agency is not a new one. No. However, I think one of the things you have harnessed and are leaning into is the idea that technology, people, flexibility, ability to get funding yep. is all a different world right now. Yep. It was it was very hard if you wanted to do this in, in, the, in the 90s or early 2000s. I agree. And you seem to be leaning into that. I want to talk a bit about your Halo Coffee yep. thing. So, this, so one of the things I did like is that uh, Niels was able to talk this talk, but he also had a couple of examples that they were working on. Talk about Halo Coffee. Yep, so a couple of years ago I read an article in the Evening Standard which said Nespresso capsules are killing the planet, 13,500 of them every minute going yeah. to a landfill. Yeah. Plastic and metal, and they take 500 years to go away. So they're and just, the coffee's not that good. And the coffee, no, it's true, right? <laughs> yeah. And we'll get to that, it's an important part yeah. of this. And so I'm like, right, um, I'll meet these guys, they're kicking around, they go, oh, we run this coffee club, they're making exquisite, exquisite coffee at these experiences. Stuff that you, we don't get to drink every day, like beautiful single origin mm-hmm. blends, all that other stuff. And they went, oh, and we've got this. And they had this pod. And I'm like, what is that? And I said, right, let's do it. So I just hopped. It was as I was leaving Grey, and I said, okay, let's brand it. We called it Halo, the world's best coffee in a way that's best for the world. Paper pulp and a tiny seaweed uh, particle. It's com- yeah, it's completely compostable, right? Yeah, which yeah. is even further than biodegradable, which means you can throw it in your food bin yeah. and grow tomatoes out of it. The thing I also thought was interesting to your earlier point is that coffee was also shit. I love ideas that remove compromise. So currently, mm. you can either have beautiful coffee, yeah. and 12 quid for a bag of square mile, mm. or you can have Nespresso. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 we need to be able to do all of it without hurting the planet. So we put um, blends into the, the capsules that you could only get fresh, usually, single origin fresh mm-hmm. blends. Well, it made it all sorts of problems because mm-hmm. Nespresso, you can put under your stairs for two and a half years. Well, that's not coffee, is it? No. I mean, what is that? What food product can you do that with, yeah. right? Ours, you know, you've got four or six weeks, but yeah. that's okay. That's like buying fresh coffee. Yeah. So we wanted the world's best coffee in there, but we wanted it in a way that, that was best for the world. And does clearly like, own a bit of Nespresso? I don't know. Hard it to tell. sounds like it does, doesn't it? it Every, all the, it's very hard to get to the bottom of, I think he's just probably in very deep paid by success all that other stuff yeah, I, mean, I think he gives the money he makes from a lot of these ad things yep. to charity that's what all those actors do I think he does but I think it's the one thing that he's really got to look at like I look at yeah. it and go he doesn't seem to me like a penis he seems like a really oh, nice, nice guy, guy yeah. like a f- and he really gets it and then yeah. you look at this one thing he's doing and you go you just got to wind that back man like, like and also Nespresso by the way the other thing that kills me that company's so successful they could have spun a plate and experimented Absolutely. Right. That's where I was going with they, this. Why they, the hell did yeah. Nestle not make this? So someone said this. to me, because the machine is, it's too easy to make money at the moment. So when it becomes a legitimate problem and governments start yeah. banning it, like they are in France and Germany, mm. then they will. Yeah. But until then, why would you? And that's a, re- that's a really depressing yeah. sentiment. <laughs> well, so, I think, you know, I've worked at P&G, Nestle, Kraft. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, they get, they yeah. get worse or slightly yeah. better. But when it comes to... Re, like oh and we have to change the planet yeah. and all consumer is yeah. king and yeah. all we got you know they do tend to just not be at the leading yeah. edge of innovating yeah. but also they're not taking it personally so that's my main thing which right. is all those guys have inherited something that they are trying to run to their best as opposed yeah. to thinking with their gut and heart every day going what's the right thing to do regardless of consumers yeah. that's that's why Halo came from is actually yeah. why it sh- just shouldn't be that way yeah. it doesn't have to be and so, you know, uh, that's been a mad journey. We sold in 22 countries. It got too successful too quick. The business basically fell over. Really? You know, we've been out of stock for about three or four months. Shit. Yeah, but we've got a COO, yep. changed it. We're back in stock in literally in three weeks' time. Mm. We've rebuilt the whole brand. I'm really, really excited. But it's been a hell of a journey, a hell of a learning. And I wouldn't say it's, it's not been easy, but I wouldn't say it's been hard, right? Yeah. Like, there is this other thing, which is I couldn't possibly do that. Partner with people in market. You know, I know a lot of people have played with starting brands. There's two differences that we have. One, we have a principle around the brands that we start. Mm-hmm. So other places have gone, yeah, we'll just start a toilet brush with a camera in it. I, I'm, I have no interest in doing that. <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I get like, it. I'm like, there's some brands that we believe yeah. should exist. Yeah. And I think that fuels <clears throat> the yeah. energy it takes to do it. And two, we always partner uh, or bring in very early industry experts. So, you know, add people pretending they can run a global coffee business. That's yeah. the worst idea in the world. Yeah. So I got coffee guys on board. But also energy. So Dave Trotz says energy beats talent. And I completely agree with that sentiment. I've always loved it. And the real reason I love it is you need energy when it gets hard, not when it's easy. So when someone says you can't do that, you just keep saying yes, I can. Mm. And when someone says you haven't got the money, you go and get the money. And when it's crap because you haven't, you've experimenting, you keep going. That's the difference, man. I remember in in one of the Mad Men, uh, Draper was reading Meditations in an Emergency. You opened today with the world is burning from death of a salesman. And... 
I quite like that urgency because I don't find it. I find I find it uh, a very positive and important yes. and necessary yes. approach to creativity, not just in advertising across in, the in board. Everything. Yeah, mate. I, but I think all the best ideas we love, yeah. all the shit we love. Netflix, like pick pick a fucking yeah. brand you love. Mm. They're responding. I think I've I've always loved that that activism, yeah. you know. And I don't mean it in like a social. I just mean they're responding and passionate and quick to act. You know, I mentioned Netflix before. I hate eulogising them too much, but they've proven you can create a business that Correct. doesn't depend on advertising, yeah. and we'd all pay money for it. Because that's like that's obvious. But some people are, and yeah, I think okay, these are the right. brands Netflix that. Are, yeah. yeah, but I think. I mean, the and they're making Netflix, millions. When it first came out, it was like whatever eight ninety nine. And the irony is that that's the cost of two yep. vid- video rentals from Blockbuster before they went. Do you remember post, Blockbuster? Yeah, yeah. Or Next Revision. I miss that. You remember the Has smell you, in every Blockbuster? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they used to charge you 50 cent if you didn't rewind the tape. Oh, yeah. For fuck's sake. Um, what about outside the ad business? Like, your 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 background is, has always been advertising? Did you? Where, so where design, are you from? Design. What's your background? Yeah. Design. So I got. I got. Where were you born? Yeah. Wealdstone in Zone Five in Harrow, Shithole. Um, <laughs> Happy childhood. Uh, you ish. Old yeah. man was a nutcase. Um, bless him. Was amazing. Now was a biker, uh, and we had a rough childhood. Um, right. Not a lot of money. Uh, none of my family had ever been to uni. I got to seventeen years old and was like, I want a job. And I had a crush on advertising. I'm not lying. Everyone yeah, was going to I had this dream of it where I thought it was like a sort of slutty art. It was like oh, it is. but with money, which yeah. it, which yeah. isn't wrong. Got a job in the job centre as a junior in the design department at Lintas. I and loved learned, it. Yeah, right. And learned more. So my mates oh, yeah. bless them. And then I got angry at uni. My mates were at uni for four years, came out 30 grand in debt. I'd had two pay rises and I was working in Soho. That was exactly the same. I was like, I was a board director at 22. <laughs> there you go. And you go, my mates were like, I'll make another job. And I'm like, dude, you went to uni and you're yeah. now. And it killed me. Too old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fuck off. <laughs> no. Um, uh, and then came through there design was my mm. background and I got very bored with advertising because at that point actually design was a really below stairs thing it still is by the way mm. uh, the music industry and the uh, fashion industry however were using mm. it incredibly mm. so dude I was working on the side I ran Leonard Associates and I was doing show identities I was doing right. you know album covers and it was like I was enjoying that far more there's an example I, I use I wanted to do more and so I started making ads and I started making other posters and they were really like shut down. If you weren't a creative team, you'd been through that journey, mate, they shut you down. And there was this pomposity and I fucking hated it. So I made my own posters once and I decided to get them shot and I rang up Max Oppenheim, who's a photo- brilliant photographer, and he went, yeah, I'll shoot them for nothing. Mm. I was like, mate, that's incredible, thank you. Mm. Had Suddenly had these shots. I right. was like, oh shit. And then I rang up Creative Review and said, we print these? And they went, we love them. And then ran a massive DPS creative review. Three or four creatives come down from upstairs. Nils, how did you get that stuff in creative review? What, what, what? And mm. I, at that point, I was like over it. I was like, no, 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 enough. Yeah. I've been knocking on that door for years. And you guys have been going, no, no, no. I'm like, suddenly became aware of my own power, all yeah. that other shit, and just went and did that. When, 15 years later, it's easier than ever. Yeah. Oh, mate, it's incredible. You can People shoot it yourself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you can fund it yourself and all yeah. that. And, I, and all I did, man, was apply those principles to brands now. That's, my, that's where we've gone. Is I think our message was so clear when we started that I think it appealed to a certain bunch of people and they're not necessarily small yeah. like our thing is about brands of people which existed there's a way to build those that yeah. we have an operating system that we believe in so Do you think we'd get more artisanal if, sorry for using that terrible yeah, yeah. word of this yeah, advertising yeah. but you know what I mean because um, I have a kind of a feeling that in 10 to 15 years time BBDO won't exist Ogilvy and May there won't exist I mean they might exist but in a very yep. This, this idea that we get back to some sort of cottage industry which can then fuel some sort of renaissance in creativity because that seems to be the thing that's gone I mean, you look at you look at ads today yep. in any given year there's always I wish I'd done that I wish yep. I'd done that and in any given yep. month yep. I wish I'd done that yep. and that has gone I mean it's, as I say it's all diverse people in chunky yep. jumpers yep. dancing around with product comes yep. at the end yep. Not, yep. Or whatever the product yep. might be can you see a renaissance on the horizon? Well, I do, I, first of all, I kind of disagree with that in that I think we're just looking in the wrong place. So I think we're all looking for beautifully executed print commercials. That mm. do, I'm like, hang on a fucking minute. Okay, we have to look elsewhere now yeah. for things that make you feel jagged, right? Yeah. And I think those things do exist. Yeah. I just think we're looking at um, I also think our intention isn't to be cottage or artisanal. I don't want it to go that way. If, if someone wants to do that, they can. Our intention is to be important and influential. And I think we are going to show people and come hell or high yeah man come hell or high water mm. people are going to say uncommons where you go when you want to step it fucking up yeah. people that that we're appealing to at the moment aren't coming for a one percent sales uplift they're coming for radical change they're coming for a massive leap cultural impact you know and I I don't want to view that in a small way mm. you know I don't think it is small you close with the famous network film uh, yeah. Yeah. rant <laughs> which is brilliant 
and that's what 1974 whenever that was made this idea of getting pissed off and uh, tackling the haters and don't worry about career I quite like that one as well yeah. this idea of having a career yeah it's so dated and, out and weird now at the moment outside of the business are you optimistic about the way the world is moving in general yeah or I think pessimistic? yeah no really well, optimistic but yeah. I think we have to act and I think we can either choose in our game to be part of the change or just watch it and I think the opportunity is huge genuinely man yeah. like if you're in the right conversations and people are desperate now for yeah. decisions for new thinking if you're in the right conversations we're more powerful than we've ever been before we could never tell Ovo that they should sell renewable energy and they should focus all their energy that's what's happened it's so Ovo is one of your other kind of clients yeah. just briefly to say what they're doing because you've got some interesting work on them as well yeah well Ovo anti-Trump anti stuff anti yeah <laughs> yeah I mean Ovo are brilliant again owner founded so they came from that similar place they have a load of different offerings but a big portion of their business is leaning into the future which is electric vehicles renewable energy and I just think that they hadn't told anybody that and no one who they were and they sort of kept the gloves on I think around how they felt about it and we were like no just take the gloves off people feel like you do they just need to be told who you are and how to change it yeah. and um, so that was a bit of work so they're there. solar and wind mainly I think it's really complicated the more you get into it essentially renewable energy works from a variety of different sources but you can as a consumer choose to either have renewable pumped into your house or not mm -hmm. on a given day it will come from more from wind on a given day it will come more from somewhere else it depends on the certificates and all that other crap yeah. so it's deep yeah. the long and the short of it though is that the world would be a better place if all of us rang up and said we'll have renewable please Great. Yeah, and yeah, it doesn't great spot you do uh, there's no, a link to spot on the uh Learn for the podcast if anyone wants to link into it. The idea of AI and robot o overlords and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Longer down the track. Yeah. What's your predictions there? Uh, well, yes. If we are in Will the we business. we have chips in our heads? No. Well, hopefully. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Smart, right. guy depends how it feels, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know. I think I'm, I'm optimistic there, too. Like, we, you will need leaps and vision and direction, and they can't do that. Machines can't do that. Okay, they can't. If you're in the business of mechanizing, so to your point about the O&Ms or whatever, what do you value? If your company wakes up every day and you could replace everything in your company with a machine, well, that's going to happen. If your company wakes up every day and believes in something else, then it's not. And I, I'm like not allergic to that. There is no clash in my mind. Mm. It's not even a competition. This idea of creativity versus AI. I'm like, what are you talking about? Mm. You know, it'd be very interesting to see how AI delivers creativity. Very much. Yeah. We all, when we come up with something, whether we know it or not, it's all based on yeah. stuff we've seen that's gone into our brain. Yeah. And we're just kind of spitting yeah. it out a different way. Whether they can do the, the human, the crazy jump. You know, the, 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 yeah. that's yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. And that's yeah, most yeah, yeah. of the greatest dads ever have done. So my, like my theory on it is AI will get really good at doing the right thing. Okay. Here's the right thing to do. Yeah. I've looked at culture and I've looked at social commentary and I've looked at this thing and here's yeah. the right thing to do. What creativity does is often completely the opposite. Exactly. Here's completely the wrong thing to do. It's the, the wrong right thing, thing to say. It's the wrong thing that's to it. do. That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and that is something I don't think they'll ever get their heads around. And if they do, it'll be super random. You'll feel it, man. Yeah, yeah. I also think like, I don't know. I just look at it and go, that whole industry of creativity never mind within advertising I want us all to stop just going it's there right. so, so the other thing we should all be thinking about is it's so true Instagram is a return to the 1960s magazine cover the most powerful punchy single image you can possibly mm. make the face that, and all that, that mate, that's Instagram now yeah, yeah. so that Trump stuff we made that's pure insta bait yeah, right I'm like yeah. I want it shared there that's a return to our craft not a, yeah. not a removal of it well that's what I'm saying like this idea that we, it has to break down to people who've got skin in their yeah. own game like what you're doing yeah attracting clients who are brave enough to understand that they need to kind of break out from the kind of the, the, the sort of uh, morass of banality that's out there yeah. you know we started the podcast saying I was very cynical but I do like listening to people who arrive in and say what you say and have stuff to back it up with and, and you know I can feel your Thanks. energy and your kind of uh, where you want where you want to go with this so what do you say to a you know an 18 year old kid who's because one of the biggest problems is attracting yep. those kids. Yep. They want to go to Facebook and, and, and Google, and and, they, and those companies are far better looking out for them than we are. Because when they come into our age, they get given fed shit, and they don't get given the big opportunities. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who's yes and no. listening to so, this? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. No, I'm into this. Part of the reason we started Uncommon is also talent based, which is I used to think actually that they were going to Google and Facebook. Uh, the best of them yeah. so, so we can talk about all, all of people but the best yeah. people aren't doing that they're just starting their own thing they're not going to Google or Facebook they can go there for a couple of years but they're actually coming straight out of places like Berg's or even you know in London and they're going hang on a minute I've just written three or four things that could be marketing ideas for fucking Pizza Hut mm. but could be brands in their own right and the best of these people man they're just sidestepping us all completely now my dream is that we are attractive enough to borrow them 
yeah. on loan and they can come make some work on brilliant big clients and learn but if they want to start their own brands they can do it at Uncommon and we'll be a safety blanket and we'll be a safety net if they want to go do that my dream is you come out of Bergs you've got this amazing stuff you want to learn from people you want to understand how to story tell there are mechanics and techniques and craft to starting brands as much as there are to making ads and we get that and I hope that that's what we speak to and also I think the only thing that you can't replace with the Googles or whatever is you join Google and you kind of go yeah but there's no one at Google bleeding for it man yeah. not really where's the you know that's the one attractive thing our industry has yeah. more than them okay do you want to work for people who feel it because they don't man you well Jay Shire's famous quote how, you know, how big are we going to get before we get bad it's yeah. still relevant yeah, right it is uh, because with size comes yeah. complexity. I read somewhere that most companies every day spend 80% of their resources just keeping the company going, yeah. not innovating, no, not, not pushing. doing different things, no. just paying yeah. people That's it. and putting That's coffee it. in the coffee yeah. machine yeah. and hoovering up now, after everybody. And if you speak to the right people at Google, I know a load of people there and I think they are an incredible company. Incredible if you look at what they've done, the dent they've made. But you kind of go, my God, the permission they could have to do far more, I think is the, the enthralling thing about them as a company. And I kind of just wish they could take the gloves off. Do you think blockchain and all this kind of stuff is going to disrupt things like Facebook and, and, and yeah. Google and, and like to the point where Google or Facebook may not even exist? Facebook might not. I think Google have got their fingers in so many pies. I mean, Facebook have too, but I look at, at Facebook in particular in its current iteration. I think that's going to change. I think it's also going to change because our interest is waning. Never mind yeah. blockchain. I think we're getting sick of seeing. So I thought it was really interesting. To, uh, we're yeah, it's talking about boring. It's really boring. And you see. And time consuming. Uh, yeah. And a sort of addictive in a naff way now. Yeah. So when it started, you were into it and people used to share the things they love. Now they share the things they hate. Yeah, that's true. Right? Uh, someone, uh, Faris, who's a very talented she used to be planner. Twitter's domain. <laughs> right. <laughs> called it the age of outrage is yeah. what he called yeah. it. And, and you're seeing people share the shit they hate. And I think that gets boring because there's only so much. It's like a bilge pipe of misery. I'm like, yeah. I don't want to see that. Yeah. But this idea that something else has to come along, that where things like our own data and our own stuff, we get paid. I mean, Google apparently make $31 a year on me. Right. Through advertising. Right. Maybe they should be paying me 20 Yeah. Maybe Facebook yeah. should be paying me 10 Yeah. If I want to be on their yeah, thing. Yeah, maybe, yeah. And then something like that. I, I was a bit disconcerted, though, when, when all Zuckerberg's woes happened this year, where he... Uh, I was expecting a Facebook killer yeah. to come out of the woodwork, yeah. and I didn't. Let, Let me just... tell you this one thing. So I don't know where I go with this, but just to respond to it. Yeah. Thing. Uh, you remember when Ted came out and, and everyone was trying to do fucking Ted, basically? All the yeah. agency networks launched their own. You must, you, you'll remember all this yeah, shit. Yeah. You get asked to all these events now. There's four panels, and there's this, and there's that, yeah. and there's this. And everyone's trying to tweet it and share Our it. Podcast. And do, <laughs> yeah, right, but probably yeah. just. And I got asked this one thing by somebody. I won't say who. It, it emailed me direct. Very connected person. I was like, wow, I got an email from them. Yeah. We weren't in our industry. So come to an evening, there's 25 people coming, you're one of them. What wine do you like? What, you know, what, it was incredible. I was like, wow, okay. And he said, the editor the of... Was, <laughs> the ed- editor of a certain newspaper is going to speak. No social, no tweeting, no nothing. Oh. 25 people turned up. Yeah, fine, but I must have told this story a thousand times. Yeah. I've never talked about the panels I've been on. I've never talked about the things that got tweeted and whatever. But what happened? It, here's what happened. We were treated to a very privileged bit of information and mind mm-hmm. of somebody. The people that he'd selected were very carefully selected in order to have very powerful conversations with each other about it. And we all then went off having made some connections, talking about the luck of having been in that moment. And I thought that was a really meaningful, really powerful way to view a social network. Mm-hmm. And so my point is, actually, when you get Facebook or whatever, I think we're returning to scarcity, yeah. to, to depth, to, to small, powerful moments, all the things that we've always had around campfires or around whatever you want to call it. I think there's a preciousness to that. And that feels new again. It feels like a new value. Well, even the podcast revolution. Yes. I mean, the idea that we yes. missed people are sitting listening to two and a half hour podcasts with Joe Rogan yep. or Sam Harris or Norman yep. or Jordan Peterson or whoever. And they're all surprised yep. at the audiences they're getting because yep. radio killed itself yep. by advertising it. too much, it, too much of it and, and shallowness. Ultimately, keep, keep, it, it. keep it pure. I thought it was genius, that guy, because the, the thing I went to was not in any way of course it was but it wasn't engineered in any way for public consumption or for advertising yeah. or for any benefit at all yeah. it was like that's a gift that's the thing we're doing yeah. I was like wow well, okay that's cool if I got asked for one of those a month I'd go and so you kind of that, so it just, would I yeah, yeah. You just go back I probably to wouldn't be cynical no mate you'd, you'd love it <laughs> yeah but this is I mean this is good you're doing it for you right yeah, well, this, is this, go, this is uh, there's no money in this no. but I've you know I've done a hundred episodes now and I, as I say I've never done a hundred of anything except yeah. for rice <laughs> but, like, but let's all talk to your listeners and say right if you charge them all 5p would they want yeah, you to keep going no, and you kind of go yeah probably my will. Patron account will be coming soon and I hope those <laughs> listening will do it Nils Leonard thank you for yeah, taking the time I know you're, you're busy Uncommon is the agency there's lots of links to it at the bottom of the podcast check it out especially if you're a client and you're bored at one of the big agencies like I was thanks a million thanks
the podcast has been going for three years now. It's always been a labor of love, uh, self-funded. Um, and it does cost uh, money to, p- to put together, uh, not least in terms of time. Each episode of Jubilee takes about 10 hours to edit. Um, and there's associated costs with travel and uh, uh, flights and stuff when I, when I travel overseas to meet my guests, particularly in London. Um, I've always wanted to keep the podcast ad free. I have had requests and offers to take advertising on it. Um, my sort of slightly jaundiced views on advertising have kept me away from that avenue. Also, because I feel radio uh, as a medium has been killed by advertising to the point where, you know, every hour on commercial radio is almost 23 minutes now of ads. People in the media have missed what is happening in podcast world where people are clearly showing that they want more than soundbite level journalism and short sheep dip type interviews. There's a huge, huge uh, listenership globally for podcasts much bigger than mine that go on for two hours. Sam Harris, the Waking Up podcast is one I thoroughly recommend. Um, As an example of that, Sam too uses Patreon and most podcasters are trying to sign up to some way of monetizing their wares. I feel a bit weird asking people to sign up, but um, if all of the podcasters do it, uh, then it at least gives a corporation free ability for listeners to contribute and help with the running costs of their favorite podcasts. So the Patreon system is www.patreon.com backslash Shawnee B. On there, you're asked basically to commit a monthly subscription fee. This is a bona fide website. Um, all podcasters around the world use it. And they'll ask you to put your credit card details in and agree a nominal amount that you'll pay every month. Look at it like the fact that you pay 250 per day or two pounds per day on a paper or a cup of coffee. The actual amount is not important to me in the slightest. I just love the idea that there are patrons who value the podcast and feel it's a worthwhile contribution to thinking and ideas. And so I would ask those people if you have money to spare and you are able to afford a couple of bucks a month to please, please uh, sign up. It would be very much appreciated. This said, if you can't afford it, um, the podcast is going to remain free to everybody. Um, that's the intention with which I um, brought it out. And uh, if you can't afford to pay, don't worry, just listen and uh, continue to enjoy it. So that's a little ad for the podcast. It's the only it's the only ad I hope you'll ever hear on a pint with Shawnee B. And please, if you have three minutes to spare, a couple of bucks a month to spare, I'd really appreciate it if you go to the website and sign up. The website address again is www.patreon.com backspace Shawnee B. Thank you.